Hello, welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. We're here today at Gross Point North High School in Gross Point Woods, Michigan, to talk to the uh, teacher and students who belong to the RATS team. What are RATS? Well, we're going to uh, talk about that a little bit later in the show, but right now we want to start off here in the control room of the radio telescope and find out a little bit about the hobby itself. We're going to talk to Andrew first, and Andrew, what exactly is radio astronomy, and well, actually, why radio astronomy and not optical? Well, we did radio astronomy originally because Mrs. Hill took a group of students down to the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in West Virginia, uh, a group of Earth science students she had as part of a club. And when they got there, they realized that the advantage to radio astronomy here is that in Michigan, we have a problem with weather, as you've noticed, living here. And radio astronomy isn't affected by rain or clouds, unlike optical, because the radio waves still come through all that, and we can still receive them. Additionally, because of that, also, we can do it at any time during the day, and not just at night. So we could do it during a school day or directly after school, whenever students are available. And to coincide with the weather thing, uh, since we don't have to be outside with the telescope, we can operate everything from down here with our computers, and our students don't have to get, you know, wet or soggy or what have you to just to take a few images. Cold or hot or anything else? Basically. It's, it's very comfortable this way. Well, that's good, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, I know being an optical astronomer myself, it's uh, a challenge when the clouds roll in. We're out of business. And, uh, but it's good to see that you can operate under any type of weather conditions. Now, what is the radio astronomy team, Mrs. Harold, and uh, how did it get started here at Gross Point North? It, it actually started at Gross Point South High School. I taught at Gross Point South back in the late 80s, and at that time I had an earth science club, and I used to take them all over, as Andrew said, and do interesting things with them. Well, once we went to West Virginia, they said, we want our own radio telescope. So we decided to build one here. We started in November of 1989. It took us about two years to build our first telescope. Well, because there was a group of students who just dedicated themselves to the telescope, and they weren't really part of the club necessarily, we decided to form a new club called the Radio Astronomy Team. And a couple things about that, how we picked our name. We wanted to call ourselves a team, not a club. Because in building the telescope, we got very, very close to each other, kind of like family, like a team is. And so we decided that we were more a team than we were a club. And the other thing about the acronym RATS is if you turn it around, it spells STAR. So we had Radio Astronomy Team, and the S is to be unknown. Over the years, we've given the S different meanings, like students or scientists or some secret club meeting. Okay, very interesting. And the club is obviously going strong today. About how many members do you have? We have uh, probably a core group of about eight to ten members, and then we have uh, probably about a half a dozen more people that float in and are out. I see. And, of course, as the uh, students graduate out, you have to recruit new students uh, to right. uh, join the team. Yes. And the, the team is open to everybody, and somebody else I think will be talking to you about that. All right, good. Yeah, we'll look, uh, look forward to that. Uh, we are, as I mentioned, in the uh, master control room of the radio telescope here at Gross Point North High School. Next, we're going to talk to Thomas. And uh, Thomas, what type of student actually joins the team here? Um, people interested in astronomy, um, people that joined because they wanted to join because their friends joined, um, people who wanted to use power tools, people who wanted to go on the roof. Um, <laughs> people interested in fields in engineering and uh, science and courses like that. Okay, and how long have you been a member of the team? Um, two years. All right, two years, that's good. Uh, how about the rest of you? Uh, Andrew, how long have you been? Uh, this is my fourth year. Your fourth year, okay. So you're graduating this year, I can assume? A senior? Right, and Andrew is also our president. Ah, all right, well, congratulations, Andrew. And uh, anything else you'd like to add about uh, the student involvement with the RATS team? Um, the students built the telescope. Um, they, do, they do a lot of the work on the telescope. Um. All right, well, Thomas, thank you. I think that helps our viewers kind of understand the, uh, the type of folks that uh, help man the team, man in the generic sense. And, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Lastly, before we head outside and upstairs onto the uh, roof to actually take a look at this telescope, we're going to talk to uh, Gabby and to Jamie about the type of activities that the club engages in. Well, most of it usually starts at the beginning of the year with our meet and greet with like, all the new students. You know, we go around, we take a tour, and as being a freshman, me and Gabby, Gabby both <laughs> took it, <laughs> um, you know, and like, it just goes on from there you know we go and meet other astronomy clubs and it's really like we get to learn because most of them are usually optical mm -hmm. and it's like fun to like compare and contrast like what you know the differences are and then you know as it gets colder we can't go outside and work on the telescope so we usually have to like stay indoors and we uh use the planetarium for movie night this year we actually watched 2001 a space last it was really interesting and then also around christmas time we have a rats yearly christmas party and you know, this year it was so much fun, but I, apparently two years, no, two, three years ago, there was a 20th anniversary where so many members came back, and I really wish, you know, I could have been there, but, you know, I hear it was amazing. Well, that's good. And then, uh, Gabby, how about you? Oh, um, one of my favorite things we did as a club was the trip to NRIO in Green Bank, West Virginia. Um, it was really fun because we got to do our own scans on the... 40-foot telescope. That uh, was probably the highlight trip of the year, I would imagine. Do you take any other field trips uh, as part of the team? Uh, sometimes we go to other colleges and visit other like astronomy clubs, like the Ford Astronomy Club. And once we went to um, Eastern Michigan to hear a couple speeches. Okay, did you get into the observatory there, the Scherzer Observatory? Yes, we did. It was, it was really fun. It's an awesome facility, isn't it? Oh, yes. It's so amazing. It's floating above the air. <laughs> yes. Well, I want to thank all of our students here and Mrs. Harrell, their instructor, for uh, a lot of this good background information about the radio astronomy team here at Gross Point North High School. We're going to take a quick break. And uh, if you have a question, please send us an email. You can see the address down there at the bottom of your screen. And uh, right after term of the month, we'll be back with more from the radio astronomy team at Gross Point North High School. Stay tuned. The term of the month for January 2013 is Jansky. Now, there are two Janskys to talk about, and they both have to do with radio astronomy. So we thought it was a good idea to talk about them both. Uh, this month, since we're talking about radio astronomy. At first is Carl Jansky. Carl Jansky joined Bell Telephone Laboratories in 1928, and he did a project where he was to investigate sources of radio noise in the 10 meter to 20 meter wavelengths range uh, for, uh, for use potentially in a transatlantic telephone system. So Carl Jansky built an antenna, and this antenna could be rotated. In fact, it came to be known as Jansky's merry-go-round. So it's not a dish antenna like you're sort of used to. It's uh, more like a dipole antenna. It's just really a wire, but you could steer the wire. You could point the antenna in different directions. With this antenna, Carl Jansky uh, was able to detect nearby thunderstorms and distant thunderstorms. But he also uncovered a faint unknown source. Now, I should back up just a little bit. He recorded the data from the antenna on what's called a chart recorder. So there's a pen on paper, and when the amplitude, when he gets more signal, then the pen moves farther, and when there's less power, he gets it, it doesn't move as far. So you get these little scribbles on paper. So uh, he gets this unknown source, and he thought at first that his unknown source was the sun. He thought, you know, and it made sense. Except that as he continued his observations, he found that the source moved. After about a month, it wasn't pointing at the sun at all. In fact, he found that the source moved every 23 hours and 56 minutes. 
Now, Karl Jansky was not an astronomer, but he did have a vague idea that it had to be uh, a source that was uh, that corresponded to more distant objects, the stars or something. Uh, and in fact, he discovered, uh, with the help of uh, some nearby uh, astronomy department, uh, he found that the uh, source was in the constellation Sagittarius. These days, we understand that Sagittarius is where the center of the Milky Way galaxy lies. And in fact, there is a massive, a supermassive black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And it, in fact, emits, um, it emits power from long wave uh, radio all the way up through uh, X-rays and gamma rays. It, it produces power everywhere. And this was very likely the source he was looking at. The other Jansky is a unit that um, Jansky invented, and it's also named after him. And it's kind of a, a weird unit. What it's trying to get at is it's trying to get at how bright is a radio source. And it has these kind of funny units. It's 10 to the minus 26 watts per meter square per hertz. So let's deconstruct this just a little bit. A watt is a unit of power. Now imagine, like in the left-hand corner of this diagram, you've got a bucket. And the bucket has water in it. The water would represent energy. Power is energy per unit time. Now imagine you've got a little hole in the bucket and water is spurting out. The amount of water that is spurting out per unit time, that represents power. So we've got a leaking bucket uh, concept here. Now meter squared, that's a unit of area. So here we have power through a unit area, a, a per unit of area. Doesn't matter how big the unit is, uh, per unit of area. And then hertz is kind of interesting also. This is a band of frequencies. So let's say in Jansky's case, uh, he was interested in radio between 10 meters and 20 meters. Well, his bandwidth is the 10 meter to 20 meter uh, area, which turns out to be in the megahertz uh, frequency range. For visible light, the uh, bandwidth is from 400 terahertz to 790 terahertz, and the total bandwidth is 390 terahertz. So it turns out that visible light, which is normally measured using magnitudes, can be converted through a formula, you can look it up in Wikipedia, to Jansky's, and vice versa. The Jansky is a measure of radio brightness. Term of the month for January 2013 is Jansky. Welcome back. We're here on the roof of Gross Point North High School to take a look at this amazing radio telescope. With me is Andrew. And Andrew, what can you tell us about this telescope? How is it built? Well, we've built each of our dish, dishes from scratch. Um, the way we do this is we buy all of our parts wherever we can get them, basically, because no place is really designed for someone who's trying to do radio astronomy specifically, because it's a rather uh, unknown field, as opposed to optical astronomy. Um, so what we did is we got all of our parts from scratch. What we have up top is we have our antenna, which is housed in our coffee can, and then that is taken out through the wiring, the signal from the antenna is taken through the wiring back into the coffin. The dish itself is made from a hardware cloth, which is smaller than the wavelength of the radio waves we take in, which is 21 centimeters. Each of those is about a centimeter apart. And that reflects all of the radio waves back into the antenna because it's parabolic with the focus at the antenna. And then uh, the, uh, the arm that houses the front end in the coffee can is held on by aluminum and some guy wire which keeps it focused and straight so that there's no bending so we can point our dish exactly where we want it. All right, and you talked about uh, the coffin. 
Andrew, tell us about the inner workings of the coffin here on the telescope. Well, on the right you can see there that we have our new motors, which give us more torque so we can work in worse weather conditions, and the gears which move the telescope itself. Uh, more towards the middle, we have the cables that run from the top of the telescope, the antenna. They bring the signal back into the coffin. On the left, you'll see we have those white boxes. And what those do is they take our signal and give us something that we can actually work with. And that gets transferred to the computer. We can use the, our computer software then to give us a radio scan, which we take back into the control room th through an Ethernet cable that runs back out of the coffin and down the roof. Thank you, Andrew. All right, well, let's talk about what's under the coffin, Andrew. Well, below that we have a housing, which is what we call a foam booth. And what it does is it, uh, it provides support for the coffin so that it's off the ground and off of our base, which is made of wood off of the top of the roof so that we don't have any flooding at the base or anything. Um, what we also have back there are the back arms of the dish, which are used to counterbalance it so that we don't have any tipping issues, so that the dish can stay where we point it. Um, those are uh, held by counterweights, which we call our hot dogs and buns, because they, the counterweights are cylindrical, kind of like a, a hot dog. And uh, with those, we can make sure that the dish never tips over, so that we can stay pointed where we want and get our signal. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. Next we have Zach, who's going to tell us exactly what is radio astronomy. Well, radio astronomy is, is uh, pretty similar to optical astronomy, where the photons come in and they bounce off this parabolic surface, which acts like the mirror, and then they go up into the coffee can, and um, it, where there's a waveguide which sorts out some of the waves, and then uh, they get, um, which is like, it's a lot like the eyepiece, and then it goes into an antenna, which and then into a low noise amplifier which amplifies the wave about a million times so it can be seen then it gets sent down to the coffin where it is then converted to a lower frequency so it's easier to uh, transport and then it's also then converted to voltage and then sent down to our control room and then onto the computer where we can read it okay and you really don't get a picture like an optical astronomer would, but it's uh, more of a, a data set? Yes, it's more of a graph of different uh, frequencies and amplitudes. All right, great. Well, I hope that uh, helps kind of clarify a little bit about what radio astronomy is. Next, uh, we're going to find out how these images actually differ from an optical image. And uh, Chris, if you could help us out uh, with that, please. All right. Well. Well, as you can see, it's uh, it's it's a lot different than a you know a regular optical telescope, um, but generally the concept is the same. You know, like Zach was describing, you know, the electromagnetic energy comes through, you know, uh, comes from objects from space, and then it's reflected, and then it goes into the uh, the coffee can, and then um, and so what we use what we use then those uh, it's actually voltage that comes out, and then those, the voltage comes out on the uh, as graphical values. And then, uh, and unlike, unlike on an optical telescope, you know, when you have a camera attached to it, you know, uh, it goes into a sensor, and then there's pixels on there, and then, you know, there's a range of uh, of light, you know, ranging f from red to you know the violet violet end. In radio astronomy, you know, we look at a similar a similar range. You know, there's a baseline first, like uh, for example. Uh, 1420 megahertz. That's that's what our telescope is tuned for. But there's a range that that goes beyond that, uh, 20 plus and 20 minus, so 1400 to 1440. Uh, just like you know, with with visual, there's you know, uh, violet to red. So, so when we get those values, then uh, instead of assigning those to you know a pixel or something like that, it'll it'll go into you know um, on the graph, on the graph it'll register, and then and since since there's objects that have different spots that are brighter than the, than the other spots, you know, one area might be more frequent than the other. You know, like I was saying, 1400 to 1440, we get those down and then we can map, map, map out an object, you know, taking mul multiple pictures. Okay, do some of these have like more intensity yeah. than others? Yeah. Okay. That's exactly right. And then when you get more intensity, as a matter of fact, you can, and more intensity on one wavelength, you can actually measure the Doppler effect. You know, if it's moving away from us or, you know, going towards us, you know, depending if it's, you know, um, however it's, it's going. 
you know. So, so when you get the final picture like that and you map it out and then you put it into a picture, you know, with, um, with the intensities, then you can, you can get all those values assigned. And can you add color to these yeah. images mm -hmm. uh, and make it seem like it was a picture taken with an optical camera? Yes, um, you know, and since radio, you know, it's not color, you know, we assign actual colors to, um, to whatever frequency you're looking at. So, so these colors, though, since they're not real colors, we call them false colors. So. All right, well, thank you. It's very, very informative for our viewers. Chris, and if you could also explain this uh, radio map that we're looking at. This radio map that you're looking at was assembled by the rats with our very own telescope. Um, and as you can see, I don't, I don't know if you can see it, but it is the Cygnus A. And what Cygnus A is, that's a radio galaxy uh, about uh, 50 million light years away. And, and so what we got here is the intensities of wavelengths that, um, that, as you can see, they differ with the color. And as I was explaining earlier, they, um, you know, depending on what you get, depending on what kind of frequencies that you get, they're, they're assigned to those colors. And so what we do, we, we individually map them out with, uh, as you can see, there's those squares. We take all those, all those pictures and then we just combine them together and then we get that map. Thanks, Chris. Chris, can you tell our viewers about the graph we're looking at? The graph that you're looking at is a scan of, the, of everybody that was with us on the trip to the NRAO Observatory that would go on every year. And so a tradition that we have is that all the, all the students will go in front of the 40-foot telescope and then they'll, you know, they'll jump around and stuff like that. And since your body emits radio waves, you know, the telescope will actually detect all, those, um, all the particles and everything that go through the telescope. So what you see here, these, uh, these peaks and stuff like that, that is the reading that the telescope gets from us. From all of the students that went on the trip down to uh, Green Bank there in West Virginia. That's correct. Okay, great. Lastly, we're going to talk to Richard about what type of objects you can detect with this telescope. Well, unlike an optical telescope, we don't actually look at stars. We look at things that emit radio waves. Radio waves are emitted by uh, spinning electrons around magnetic fields, and hydrogen is another thing we see. So we look at things like radio galaxies, uh, nebulae, which give off hydrogen. Um, we look at our own Milky Way galaxy which uh, gives off quite a bit, and we can look at our uh, center of our galaxy, Sag Sagittarius A, the supermassive black hole, and that emits a lot of radio waves. So um, basically we look at things like that. We look at uh, quasars, which is another type of galaxy that emits radio waves, and uh, nebulae, too, like I already said. So um, yeah, those are basically uh, star-forming region nebulae, which will emit the right type of uh, thing that we see. Okay, do you ever take a look at our own star? Uh, yes, our sun, too, and the moon are all uh, em emitters of radio waves because the moon absorbs our radio waves, uh, processes them, and then shoots them away that the sun brought to the moon. Well, that's very interesting. I would like to thank uh, Mrs. Harold and all of her students here at Gross Point North High School, the RATS team. Guys, thank you very much. appreciate your time and letting us come out here today. Welcome to What's Up in the Night Sky for January 2013, and congratulations, we've all survived the doomsday of December 21st, 2012. We're going to start off the new year with a new graphic for our phases of the moon. We'll bring it up here, and as we do, we're going to start on January the 4th with the last quarter. That'll be a minute before 11 o'clock in the evening, just before midnight, um, 11 o'clock. The new moon will be on January the 11th, and that's approximately uh, 3.44 in the afternoon. 
The first quarter moon will be on the 18th of January at 6.46 p.m. And the full moon will be on January the 26th. Now, a couple of things are happening in January that we don't have graphics for. It will be on the, uh, the 3rd of uh, January, and that's the point in the Earth's orbit when we're farthest from the sun, just a little more than 2 million miles more than normal. And also on the 3rd and the 4th of January are the Quantratid meteor shower. Now, they come from a constellation that no longer exists, so your best shot is to look after midnight toward the constellation of Bootes, the hunter. Now, he looks to some people like a giant ice cream cone. To others, he looks like a giant kite. Now, um, at the beginning of the New Year, on New Year's Day, first, if you look in the sky in the evening, you will be able to see Mars, but it's going to be lost in the glow. We have an image of it here just in the twilight of uh, sunset. Also on the first, if you look in the morning sky, you're going to have the beautiful, bright planet Venus shining up there. Now, just a day later, you can also look for Jupiter. It'll be up earlier in the, uh, the morning sky on the second. The same goes for, uh, for Neptune. It's also visible in the sky. And, of course, the little blue-green planet that is just barely visible, and that is Uranus. Now, if we move to the 13th, we have Mars and the Moon together in the sky. On the, uh, the 21st, you'll have Jupiter up in the sky with a, with a really nice uh, moon. And then we did want to mention um, Jupiter and Taurus. Also in the picture over on the far right, you should be able to see the minor planet known as Vesta, you know, what we used to call an asteroid. Also, uh, if you have a nice pair of binoculars, if you look in the evening sky, you'll be able to spot Messier 44, also known as the Beehive. It's a beautiful open cluster of stars, and it's best viewed in binoculars, uh, any kind you got. Um, it's just a really pretty uh, uh, grouping of stars. And Cancer, if you can find it, look between Leo the Lion um, the big question mark, and that'll be low in the eastern sky, look to the right of that, and you should be able to find a very faint upside-down letter Y. That is uh, the constellation of Cancer, the crab. That concludes what's up in the night sky for January 2013. Happy New Year, everybody, and keep looking up.